All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so I would like to introduce our featured author. Kate Moore is the award-winning New York Times and US, USA Today bestselling author of The Radiant Girls. A British writer based in London, she has published numerous Sunday Times bestsellers, writing across various genres, including history, biography, true crime, gift, and humor. She began her career in publishing after graduating from the University of Warwick and worked as an in-house editor at various publishing houses for over a decade. Most recently, and as an editorial director of Penguin Random House, and now she works full-time as an author, ghostwriter, and book editor. She's written more than 15 books, and her work has been translated in more than 12 languages. She's here to discuss her brand new book, this fabulous book right here that I just finished last week, The Woman They Could Not Silence, One Woman, Her Incredible Fight for Freedom, and The Men Who Tried to Make Her Disappear. Please welcome Kate Moore. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you, Village Books, for hosting me this evening. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, um, but greetings from England in the middle of the night uh, instead. Uh, I'm so excited to talk to you about the woman they could not silence. Um, this is a woman unfairly forgotten by history, and it's been my honour to explore her life and bring her legacy uh, to you all because she really is an extraordinary woman. Um, her name was Elizabeth Packard, but I suspect many of you have never heard her name before, because as often happens to feisty women who stand up for themselves, her name has been written out of history, and we remember instead the men who tried but failed to silence her. In the presentation this evening, I'm going to kick off shortly with a brief reading from the book, an edited extract from chapter one, and then I will um, do my presentation at, at the end. There will be questions, so please do put them in the Q&A, and I look forward to answering them at the end. And so to introduce the book and the woman, Elizabeth Packard is perhaps the most inspiring, fearless and resilient woman I have ever encountered. Picture her for a moment, five foot, one inch tall. She had long, dark brown hair that she kept swept up in the styles of the 19th century. She had brown almond shaped eyes and a nose as strong and straight as her principles. Elizabeth's downfall and her salvation came about because of one thing and one thing only. Elizabeth had a mind of her own. Her story starts on the cusp of the American Civil War in June 1860, and it starts with Elizabeth, a 43-year-old housewife and mother of six, lying in bed in her marital home. It starts with a simple question. What would happen if your husband could commit you to an insane asylum just because you disagreed with him? That's what happens to Elizabeth. And I want to turn now to the reading from the book. Before I begin, I want to really make the point that this is a history book and a non-fiction book that I've written. You will see as I do the reading, and if anyone has read my previous book, The Radium Girls, you will know that I write in a very novelistic way. And that is intentional. I want readers to be swept away by this story. I want Elizabeth to feel like a fully fleshed character, a woman almost like a sister or a friend. I want readers to walk in step with her on this journey and to feel like, like the history viscerally comes alive but I want to remind you that everything in the book is factual. Every line of dialogue, every quotation comes from an authentic historical source, a record made by someone who was present at the time. So never forget, even as you get swept up in the story, that everything is true and everything is real. So this comes from chapter one of The Woman They Could Not Silence. The date is June 18th. 1860, and the setting is Nantino, Illinois. It was the last day, but she didn't know it. In truth, we never do, not until it is too late. She woke in a handsome maple bed, body covered by a snow-white counterpane, 
As her senses resurfaced after a restless night's sleep, Elizabeth Packard's brown eyes blearily mapped the landmarks of her room. Embroidered ottoman, mahogany bureau, and smart green shutters that, for some reason, were failing to let in any light. Ordinarily, her husband of 21 years, Theophilus, a preacher, would have been snoring next to her, his gravity-defying curly red hair an impromptu pillow beneath his head. But a few long weeks before, he'd abandoned their marital bed. He thought it best, or so he'd said, to sleep alone these days. Instead, her senses were filled by the precious proximity of her slumbering six-year-old son. Her children were truly the sun, moon and stars to Elizabeth. To see their happy faces and laughing eyes offered such blessed light. It was particularly welcome in a world that was becoming, by the day, increasingly black. Such melancholy thoughts were uncharacteristic for Elizabeth. In normal times, the 43-year-old was always rejoicing. But the splits that were even now threatening her country, with some forecasting an all-out civil war, were mirrored in her small domestic sphere within her neat two-story home. Over the past four months, she and her husband had retreated behind those enemy lines, prompting much anxious foreboding from Elizabeth. The Packards had married in 1839, when Elizabeth was a green 22 and Theophilus a dusty 37. At first, all had seemed well. Elizabeth had been raised to be a silent listener and her preacher husband contentedly became the sole mouthpiece in their marriage. To make him happy, was the height of my ambition, Elizabeth wrote. That's all I wanted, to make my husband shine inside and out. The problem in their marriage had been, he didn't make her shine in return. Their characters were as opposite as it was possible to get. Where Elizabeth was vibrant, sociable and curious, Theophilus was gloomy, timorous and, in his own words, dull. Elizabeth described their marriage as cheerless. Nevertheless, she said nothing to him directly. That is, until everything changed. In 1848, the first Women's Rights Convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York, unleashing a national conversation about the rights of women. It was one in which Elizabeth and, less willingly, Theophilus took part. Countless times, the couple had warm discussions on the subject. It was Elizabeth, naturally blessed with a most rare command of language, who triumphed in these fights. Yet her victories came at a cost. She felt the demonstration of her intellect prompted jealousy, lest I outshine him. Theophilus was stung to the quick, and his grievances slowly grew. He was the kind of man who counted them like pennies, recording slights in his diary with the, um, the miserly accuracy of a rich man unwilling to share his wealth. He grumbled crossly. My wife was unfavorably affected by the tone of society and zealously espoused almost all new notions and wild vagaries that came along. Perhaps the notion that caused him most consternation in Elizabeth's words, I, though a woman, have just as good a right to my opinion as my husband has to his. Elizabeth's newfound autonomy was anathema to Theophilus. Wives obey your husbands became a scriptural passage oft quoted in their home. But Elizabeth was no longer silently listening, defiantly. She kept on articulating her own thoughts, asserting her own self, inspired by the women's rights movement that it was her right to do so. Theophilus's response was telling. He did not allow his wife agency. He did not encourage her independence. Instead, 
He wrote that he had sad reason to fear his wife's mind was getting out of order. She was becoming insane on the subject of woman's rights. On the morning of June 18th, 1860, Elizabeth shifted uncomfortably in bed, her disquiet slowly intensifying. Over the past four months, Theophilus had made it plain he wanted her gone. He could not cope with his newly outspoken wife, with her independent mind and her independent spirit, not least because Elizabeth did not keep her new character confined to their home. She asserted herself in public too. In the face of her impassioned eloquence, Theophilus felt powerless and furiously impotent. He conceived a plan. He kept it simple. Just seven words intended to silence her once and for all. When the Packards next argued, he warned Elizabeth if she did not conform, I shall put you into the asylum. Now you might think, as Elizabeth Packard did, well, what a ridiculous thing to say. Of course he can't send her to an asylum just for standing up to him. Of course he can't send her away just because she's assertive. But there you, like Elizabeth, would be wrong. Because as crazy as it seems to us today, in Elizabeth's time, women were regularly committed for acts of self-assertion, even for simply reading novels. And so as Theophilus began this campaign against Elizabeth, actually his plan fell neatly into line. To Elizabeth's shock, it wasn't only Theophilus who perpetuated this myth of her madness and intended to put her away in the asylum. As Elizabeth grew bolder, she found that she rejected her husband's religious teachings as well. And eventually she decided to leave his church and go and worship with the Methodists down the road. Now, this is such a public rejection of her husband, not only of his marital authority, but his spiritual authority too. And for Theophilus, it is the final straw. He tells his parishioners that Elizabeth is mad, and then they begin to view her behaviour through this prism of insanity. And so when they see her shouting at her husband because he had not cleaned the yard, the parishioners see this as evidence of madness, an angry woman seeming so out of the ordinary. Similarly, when Elizabeth confides that she dislikes her husband because of his controlling ways, well, this dislike of the man that she's supposed to hold most dear is seen as insanity too. Finally, her parishioners, the parishioners cite her incessant talking as evidence of madness because a woman is supposed to stay silent. And as Elizabeth becomes more and more confident in her own self, the fact that she won't shut up, that she wants to speak and to contribute to the public conversation is also seen as madness. But to Elizabeth's shock and horror, it's not only the parishioners who think this way. In fact, in the 19th century, women who had ungovernable personalities like Elizabeth, women who had strong resolution, plenty of what is termed nerve, were in fact textbook examples of female insanity. Those quotations come from the psychiatrists of the era. It was something that they diagnosed as moral insanity. And the definition was simply eccentricity of conduct. Now in the 19th century, a woman was supposed to be satisfied by the domestic sphere. She was a wife, she was a mother, and any woman who longed for anything beyond that, any woman who tried to push the boundaries beyond that was seen as mad, because surely a woman should be contented with that. And any woman who was assertive or ambitious, well, she was unnatural and therefore sick, mentally diseased. With Elizabeth now facing this situation, uh, things became very difficult for her. And in fact, in Elizabeth's case, she had two counts against her because she wasn't only assertive, she was educated. 
And in the 19th century, any woman who read or studied was also seen as liable to go mad. A doctor whose notes I read in my research for this book commented when he went to visit an all girls high school, he said to the teachers, you are training your girls for the lunatic asylum. Women who used their brains were supposed to go mad. And in fact, in May 1860, just a few months before Elizabeth is waking up in her bed, worried about what her husband is going to do next to control her. Well, in May 1860, a 15 year old girl was committed to an asylum because she'd become greatly addicted to reading novels. A doctor who can explain the reasoning behind this philosophy and this theory is Dr. Andrew McFarland, the superintendent of the Illinois State Hospital and the man to whom Theophilus Packard applies when he applies to commit his wife to an asylum. McFarland explained that the problem was when minds of limited capacity to comprehend subjects tried to do so, it ultimately led to mental breakdown. And so as Theophilus applies to McFarland to commit Elizabeth, his educated assertive wife, he found that McFarland would welcome her with open arms. Elizabeth on a hot summer's night in June 1860 was duly admitted to the Illinois State Hospital for excessive application of body and mind. Or as she put it, she'd been placed there by her husband for thinking. Now, Elizabeth wasn't too concerned at first as the door slammed shut behind her. She thought, well, okay, even if the doctors keep me here, and she hoped they wouldn't because she was clearly sane, she thought, well, no matter. I shall apply to the law for freedom. But here she had another shock because even the law was against her and on her husband's side. It was a law known as coverture, inherited from England uh, and originating in the 1100s. It seems we Brits have a lot to answer for. The law essentially said the husband and wife are one and that one is the husband. It meant that married women had no civic rights, no legal identity at all. They were mere shadows of their spouses, subsumed within the legal identities of their husband. It meant that married women had no rights, no rights to their own earnings, no rights to the custody of their children, no right even to their very liberty. The law books in Illinois at this time actually said that a husband could send his wife to an asylum by request and specifically without the evidence of insanity required in other cases. So Elizabeth finds that all the odds are stacked against her. As she enters the ward on that hot summer's night, she has no idea what is lying in wait for her. And it is to her shock as she wakes the next morning to realize that actually, all the patients around her are also sane. They have been sent there by domineering husbands or controlling fathers. And in fact, as I read the records of doctors from the time, they admitted that they uh, can, you know, committed women for acts of defying all domestic control or for causing the greatest annoyances to their families. Yet there is another truth in the fact of all these same women that Elizabeth finds. She finds that the wards are completely overcrowded. In fact, Andrew McFarland has had to apply to the le legislature for increased funding. The very year after Elizabeth arrives at the asylum, he opens a brand new wing with space to commit another 150 patients. And every single one of them will be a woman. This brings to light another truth about 19th century psychiatry, which was that simply possessing a female body meant doctors thought you were increased risk of going mad. They thought women's sexual organs and menstrual cycles caused madness. That's why Elizabeth's menstrual cycle was noted on her admittance form. This is why uh, so many women were committed. 
And in fact, uh, a woman's menstrual cycle was seen as so dangerous to her state of mind that in this time, mothers were actually encouraged to try to delay the onset of their daughter's periods. Doctors said that these young women should avoid feather beds, eating red meat, reading novels, of course, wearing drawers, and that they should uh, take cold shower baths. Absolutely ridiculous, I'm sure you'll agree. At the time, however, it was another strike against Elizabeth. She was assertive, she was educated, she was a woman, and therefore there seemed no hope for her. The only hope she had, in fact, was to abide by the treatment she was supposed to receive in the asylum. Elizabeth called it a subduing treatment, and it truly was. The idea was that women would learn to submit to masculine authority. Dr. McFarland described himself as the women's superior. He described himself as the Prospero to their Caliban. He was supposed to colonize them essentially, and he wrote that he wanted the women to learn to become elevated by his smile and to bow at his reproof. The idea was that women would become obedient wives before they were sent home, and that was the only way they would be released. Now, Elizabeth Packard responds in a very special way to this situation. As she herself wrote, in my case, this woman crushing machinery works the wrong way. The true woman shines brighter and brighter under the process instead of being strangled. Because what happens as Elizabeth is committed to the asylum, as she sees what the other women are going through, the cruel conduct, the abuse that they're subjected to, simply the way the asylum is seeing a pathology in personality and trying to crush the women's spirits, well, Elizabeth reacts against that. That early journey she had begun at home of finding her voice, of assertive her own self, Actually, she decides in the asylum she wants to continue that campaign and she becomes stronger and stronger through the crucible of suffering. She writes, the worst that my enemies can do, they have done and I fear them no more. No opposition can overcome me. And so Elizabeth Packard, completely fearless, decides to take on the authorities in the asylum. And ultimately, this is a campaign that stretches beyond the asylum too. Elizabeth truly finds her voice. And what I love about this book and her story is that it's not only the story of a sane woman locked up in, in, in an insane asylum, it's actually the story of a woman learning how to be herself and learning how to become herself. Elizabeth becomes a writer in the asylum. She's actually forbidden to write but she ignores those rules, obviously. She steals scraps of fabric and she tears out the margins in newspapers in order to keep a secret journal. And I love that this is the story of a woman finding that unsilenceable voice as she becomes stronger and stronger and ultimately moves from housewife to historically significant heroine, someone who successfully battles to improve the rights not only of the patients within the asylum, but also the rights of women and the mentally ill outside the asylum too. Elizabeth is a political campaigner, a woman who makes the world a better place, and she has left a truly extraordinary legacy. Make no mistake, even though this is a history book and it's about a historically significant heroine, the issues at its heart could not be more modern. And actually, this is how I came to the story. The story started for me not on the cusp of the American Civil War in June 1860. It started in the fall of 2017, amid the fire of the Me Too movement. Everywhere that fall, women were speaking up and speaking out. It was such an empowering time. But what really struck me about the movement was essentially why had it taken so long? Why hadn't women been listened to and believed in the past? Because in all honesty, we have always spoken up, but our words have been dismissed. As I was thinking about these ideas, my thoughts coalesced around a single realization. For centuries, whenever we women have used our voices, 
we've been called crazy. And that's something that still happens right up to the present day. Just past summer, Vice President Kamala Harris was called a mad woman. Look at Nancy Pelosi. When she stood up to Donald Trump in a meeting, he tweeted, there's something wrong with her upstairs. She is a very sick person. Even look at what was happening to Britney Spears last week, a supposedly crazy woman trying to fight against the shackles of male authority, a woman who, when she is assertive, is seemingly punished psychiatrically. These issues are absolutely still relevant today. And this is what I wanted to write about in my next book. But I didn't want to write a polemic. I think my strength as a writer is to be a storyteller. And so uh, what I wanted to do was to try to find one woman's story in history that would allow me to explore these issues, but without it sort of banging you over the head with the political reasons. I wanted readers to get swept up in the story and almost only at the end to think back and, and to take a step back and think, my God, this still happens. I can still see the parallels day after day in my own life all around me. <clears throat> And so I had to find this woman. I fell down a rabbit warren of internet searches about women and madness. And on the 15th of January, 2018, I landed in a University of Wisconsin essay that I randomly found online. Four pages in, I found a reference to a woman called Elizabeth Packard. And the moment I started digging into her story, I knew she was the one, the woman I wanted to write about next. Because what a woman she is. She's truly extraordinary. Her spirit is just so astonishing. It will take your breath away when you read in the book everything that she did and she achieved. Because this is a woman who fights against the received medical wisdom of the age. She fights against a husband who has complete legal control over her. She fights against these slurs of insanity, the way that people are trying to keep her boxed in and to deny her her voice. And yet Elizabeth is absolutely resolute in being determined that she will be heard and that she is not mad, no matter what people try and say about her, no matter how they try and wear her down, she will persist, she will persevere with what she thinks is important, with what she knows is the truth. I was amazed too at the dramatic, you know, brilliance of her story too. This was another reason I wanted to write about her because not only did her story fit the brief that I was looking for as a writer, but it had so much more besides. This is a story packed full of courtroom drama. This is a story that's about a fight against enraging injustice, this injustice that still resonates today. It stars a compelling heroine. It also features, which I personally loved, a twist of gothic horror as I take you inside the insane asylums of the 19th century. So as soon as I found Elizabeth, I, I knew this was it, the book I wanted to write next. But as I began my research, I realized that it was not going to be straightforward. There is no Elizabeth Packard special collection where I could go and research her. And that seems astonishing to me because she contributed so much to the reform movements of the 19th century. There is no memorial to Elizabeth either. Yet there is a mental health center named after Dr. Andrew McFarland, the doctor who keeps her incarcerated in the asylum, even though she is demonstrably sane. What I did find, however, and what a gift, were Elizabeth's own books, that secret journal that she scribbled away in the asylum later was published. And extraordinarily, Elizabeth was the one to make it happen. Elizabeth is a woman who is penniless. She is homeless. She is childless because she has no custody of her children. And yet she is so determined to have her voice heard that when every single publisher to whom she applies rejects the book, she determines that she'll still ensure that it sees the light of day. And she's such a forward thinking woman that essentially she crowd funds her publications. 
She literally goes from door to door, appealing to people to support her work and her story. She asks them to give her just 50 cents and thousands and thousands of people respond to her. Elizabeth was described as having an irresistible magnetism and it must have been incredibly powerful because she crowdfunds these books and they go on to become bestsellers. And I have to say, I am not surprised because they're truly extraordinary. She was a brilliant literary talent. She is just amazing at describing the reality of her situation. And of course, I've drawn on her books in my own book. So if you read The Woman They Could Not Silence, you will hear from Elizabeth herself in her own words, telling us what she was thinking and feeling at every twist and turn of the story. I really hope that that enables you to, you know, bring Elizabeth to life and for you to really get insight into this experience, her personal experience. Of course, I didn't just want to rely on Elizabeth's own writings, and I was blessed to be able to find the diary of her husband so that I could put both sides of the story and also the writings and the letters of her doctor too, so that this is not an imbalanced portrait. I have been able to draw on voices of all the main protagonists and antagonists in the story. My research also delved deeper into courtroom records, into newspapers, and perhaps most critically and shocking of all, into the medical journals of the time. And this, I think, was actually the most horrifying aspect of my research. And I knew going into it that women had been oppressed by psychiatry and I knew I was going to find, you know, shocking examples of how women were treated. But even I could not anticipate what I was uncovering. Now, I mentioned earlier how women's sexual organs were seen as causing their madness in the 19th century. And so treatments of the era focused on these two. Women would have leeches applied to their genitals because that was supposed to help calm their madness. They would have iced water injected inside them. But most horrifyingly of all, there would be surgery on these women too, something called a clitoridectomy, where they would literally cut off women's clitorises if women were deemed mad. But as I've illustrated in this presentation, a woman's madness could be simply a love of reading or uh, a desire to be assertive, even to draw on an example from the medical notes of the time, a woman who desired to break away from that domestic sphere and go and become a nurse in a hospital. As I read the case notes of women who had been subjected to this treatment, I found cases such as a 20 year old woman whose only so-called symptom of madness was that she liked to engage in serious reading. Another patient was a 30-year-old wife who had expressed dislike for the society of her husband. And you might think, well, it was 160 years ago. They did things differently then. But to my horror, my research uncovered that actually in the Western world, these operations continue to correct emotional disorder in women until the 1940s. The last recorded case was on a five-year-old girl. The more I learned about my subject, the more passionate I became. And I embarked on a research trip in America, following in Elizabeth Packard's footsteps. I traveled to Massachusetts, to her marital hometown of Sheldon, and it's way up in the north of the state, a place that is mountainous and rugged, uh, where the terrain is full of trees and forests and the houses creep with age. It's a landscape with these mountains and these trees that speaks deafeningly of what has always been and always will be. And it was really insightful for me to actually follow and travel as Elizabeth did into the Midwest, where she then lived in Illinois. And to be in those open prairies with those wide open skies above you actually really expressed the physical journey that Elizabeth went on, both physically and spiritually, because her mind opened like those wide Midwest skies. 
When I was in Illinois, I went to worship at the church where her husband had preached. I entered into this small whitewash building one Sunday morning and I joined with the congregation in the service. And that too was incredibly illuminating. Because think about a church service. As I sat there in the church, my body rose and fell in unison with those of the people around me. Our voices rose and fell as we sang and uh, spoke and prayed. And it really struck me what strength Elizabeth showed in breaking away from that cohesive community to strike out on her own. That's how brilliant she was to be able to break away from everything that she had known and yet say no. This is me, this is what I believe, and I'm going to do it. As a coder, the church now has a female pastor. And I thought that was just brilliant, that the church that had tried to silence a woman in the past is now led every single Sunday by a woman at the pulpit. The final part of my research trip, and perhaps the most powerful, was when I went to visit the asylum in which Elizabeth had been held in Jacksonville, Illinois. Like Elizabeth had done, I walked past the stone gateposts that mark the borders of the asylum grounds. They're obviously incredibly old now, the stone is crumbling, but they remain twice the height of a woman. And there is a very real sense of crossing over as you leave behind the noise of civilization and move into the quiet of what is now a community park. It's quite an eerie place, I found, full of abandoned buildings, and it has little bandstands and benches dotted about the place. Elizabeth wrote in her journals about the infant orchard that she had seen being planted. Well, now that infant orchard is grown to maturity and the trees are so many and so verdant that when the wind whistles through them, it sounds like a chorus of voices is speaking to you, trying to be heard. To my disappointment, the hospital building in which Elizabeth had been held was knocked down in 1984. I was 30 years too late. Interestingly, when they knocked the building down, they kept its limestone windowsills because over the centuries, the patients had etched their words and messages and drawings into the sills. Again, patients trying to be heard. And the site does still have secrets to uncover. In 1988, they discovered a tranche of unmarked graves that had been entirely forgotten about. The patients were always buried in unmarked graves. And so it seems this land still has things to show us and tell us. Though the building in which Elizabeth had been held was gone, I was still able to peer through the windows of the other abandoned buildings that were there. It was still haunting to peer through those windows, to see the way that paint was now unfurling from the underside of staircases, looking like underwater seaweed or a drowning woman's hair. I glimpsed orphan furniture, a desk, a chair, a hat stand with no hats. The buildings were graffitied, don't open, dead inside. But I think it is important to open the doors to the past because through them step people like Elizabeth Packard with her spirit as wide as her caged crinoline skirt her voice as unsilenced through the centuries as it was when she herself lived. Elizabeth wrote, women are made to fly and soar, not to creep and crawl as the haters of our sex want us to. And I think despite the many laws that she changed and everything that she achieved, Elizabeth's greatest legacy is this. Through her story, she teaches us all how to fly. She teaches us all what it is to believe in yourself. She teaches us how important it is to stay strong and stay true, because through that you will be true to yourself and you can fight for what you believe in. Elizabeth wrote, I will not hide my light under a bushel. I will set it upon a candlestick that it may give light to others. And her example truly does light the way through history. 
a strong, fearless woman, the woman they could not silence. And I hope that her light shines through this book and I hope it will touch your heart and your mind as it has done mine. Thank you. Well, speaking for myself, having read the book, I can say that it absolutely did touch my heart and my mind and had me just on tenterhooks as I was reading it. Thank you wondering so much. What, yeah, just wondering what was going <laughs> to happen to this, what was going to happen to this woman. And and the the question that I kept asking over and over and over as I was reading it is why have I never heard of this woman? Um, it's, it's, it's frustrating to me. What, and yeah. why do you think that is? What is it about Elizabeth Packard's story? Why, why have we not heard her story? Well, I, I think the fact that, um, you know, as I said, my whole premise for the book was, uh, you know, women are silent through this claim that we're crazy. And actually, even though Elizabeth was sane and, you know, there are, I won't give away the twists in the books, but, you know, she is demonstrably certifiably sane, you know, and that is, you know, publicly known even in her lifetime. Um, this sort of pernicious rumor and this allegation of insanity haunts her and she can't shake off the stigma of insanity. And I think the reason she's not known is because people dismissed her because of that. And in fact, there were some, um, you know, she was celebrated in her lifetime in the sense of when she died, uh, her obituary said perhaps, you know, no woman other than Harriet Beecher Stowe has done more, you know, to contribute to humanity, which is obviously such an enormous claim to make and right. shows, you know, how much Elizabeth did in the 19th century. Um, but actually, I uh, looked up, you know, centenary um, uh, observations in the Jacksonville papers, the local Jacksonville papers. So we're now talking the sort of 1960s, you know, 100 years on from when Elizabeth first becomes a, a public figure. Um, and they remembered her as a nutcase who couldn't keep her mouth shut. Um, and I think that probably tells you all you need to know about why we haven't heard of her, because, you know, she was dismissed as being this crazy woman, a woman who tried to destroy the career of a brilliant doctor. And as I say, McFarland has a health centre named after him. And history has commemorated him rather than this woman who took him on, Elizabeth Packard. And I think I think the stigma of insanity is why she's not remembered. Um, that is why, because people try to pigeonhole her. And, you know, even in the, the 20th century, people were writing about her, but very dismissively and saying how insane she was. It's, it's funny because that you mentioned Britney Spears earlier, because I was mm -hmm. last week, I was absolutely, as I was reading this book and I was hearing about yes. Britney Spears in the news and and just going, wow, you know, here here is an adult woman who is making making her living yeah. um and 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 still trying to fight for the right to her estate you know that was turned over this conservatorship it was to her father it yeah that the par the, the the parallels are shocking they really are yes they they really are. i mean I, I was just haunted by it as i was reading her testimony um mm -hmm. you know as i say as you say it, it's just history repeating itself all over again yeah could, could you talk a little bit about, um, so there, there, there's such a wealth of information that you had because she wrote everything down. Um, I, I love imagining, you know, every, every bit of paper, piece of paper she could get her hands on. Um, yeah. She was writing, and this is not a spoiler, um, in, in the book, there are, there are pictures um, through, in the book, um, but you can see just how much of that I mean did you you must have poured through did you pour through everything were you able to see any of the actual documents themselves in person sadly not I couldn't you know okay. the, the scraps of fabric and so on and um, as far as I know have not survived the passage of time okay. um and as I say it's really shocking that there is no Elizabeth Packard special collection because as you say she wrote copiously 
And you would think, you know, those obviously existed physically as manuscripts somewhere, somewhere at some point in time, but they don't survive anymore. So someone at some point must have destroyed them, whether that was Elizabeth, whether that was her family. Uh, we don't we don't know at what point in history they went. But luckily, as I say, she published her books. And so um, we have the typeset versions um, that we can draw on. And, you know, thank God she did write it all down, because, as I say, history commemorates her as this mad woman and it's only because she's left this record behind that we're actually able to see the true woman and to see what she said and what she thought. Yes, and, and I, I was so impressed by you know her ingenuity in hiding the things that she wrote. Oh, it's, yeah, she's absolutely brilliant. And, and, you know, I love that as well, you know, hiding things, you know, in the, the board back of a mirror or in the millinet crown of her traveling bonnet, you know, and people actually remark, you know, this, this hat's a bit heavy uh, because she's literally sort of lined it with all the sort of uh, scraps of fabric and, uh, and newspapers that she's uh, sort of squirreled away to write upon. Uh, but no one ever actually looks inside the hat to see, you know, why is it so heavy? Uh, yeah, right. and she, I mean, she truly was brilliant. You know, she's described as having a fine mind and a brilliant imagination. Uh, the doctor actually remarks on the perfection of her mind. You know, she was truly extraordinary. You know, e even before she married, Elizabeth had a teaching career and she taught at Randolph College in Massachusetts. And it's an establishment that, uh, you know, the records say it only took, you know, the best classical educators. And she was the principal of the college. You know, this is a 19 year old woman who is doing this. So she's absolutely, I you know. I yeah. remember reading that thinking she's the principal of a college and she's 19 years old. Yeah. My yeah. goodness. Um, uh, Terry asks, um, so how long did you research this book? So, so you, you really kind of were inspired. You knew that you wanted to go this route for your next subject, finding a female um, a person like this. Um, and so it was 2017. Um, how, how long was the actual research and, and the writing of the book? So it's essentially it was just over two years. So I, I found, first found her name 15th of January, 2018. I wrote it in my diary. Um, I, I said partly partly because having done the radio girls and people were always like you know people are interested in the genesis so I thought this person sounds interesting I'm going to make a note in the diary and now I can say it was the 15th of January 2018 and um, I delivered the book my final manuscript um, on the 4th of March uh, 2020 uh, just before the pandemic hit uh, ironically I'd already been in lockdown for months before uh, the pandemic hit because I've been uh, writing and finishing up my research so right. the world didn't change like you know lockdown Self self-imposed self-imposed yeah, lockdown I was, I was <laughs> working towards this deadline thinking right when I get the book delivered I'll be able to see my friends we'll have cocktails you know no none of that happened um so yes yeah, so it was a little a little over two years and I would say you know I'm the type of writer who does all my research first. I, I want to know everything, you know, the, what the weather was like on that day, what kind of clothes did they wear in that time? Uh, you know, or every single detail is, is sort of squirreled out before I start. And then actually, because I've done so much research, I'm able to write relatively quickly. So it was kind of um, two years of, uh, you know, uh, research and then like two months of writing. That's sort of how, oh, that's how it's sort of the balance of, uh, of, of the writing and the research for me personally. I will say I completely over delivered on the 4th of March. So I then had to spend months cutting back the manuscript. <laughs> I, lost a, I lost a whole part. There was a part one that uh, sort of explained the, the, the countdown and the build up to Elizabeth going to the asylum, okay. the way the parishioners turn against her. And I conceived it as a kind of um, Arthur Miller's The Crucible, you know, the, the witch hunt um, mm -hmm. against Elizabeth within her community. Uh, but all of that had to go so that the book now opens uh, June 18th. <laughs> but, oh, and it's so, to, the, the, this is also not a spoiler, it's pretty much right at the beginning of the book, but just to see, you know, so many people in the community who supported her, who she mm. had, she had these friends, all the very, a lot of people in the community who very, who were on her side and didn't want to see her, see her committed. Yes. And still, and still there, there's well, they're, the, they're, the, they're, the powerlessness. powerlessness. Yes. Yeah, completely. Because as I say, she, she was essentially her husband's property mm -hmm. and he could do what he wanted with her. Um, and and right. he does. Right. Right. Women were not actually considered like once, once they were married, they were not considered like living beings. It was no, exactly. Just... And se sentient beings, which I think is quite important. Yes. You know, married women were actually 
sort of lumped together with what they called the insane or idiots of the time. Um, you know, they had the same legal rights, and or, or I should say the same, you know, loss of legal rights. Uh, so that's, yeah, married women, the insane and idiots, They all the legislation grouped them in together. Wow. Wow. Well, um, Janet Oakley, um, a, 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 an historian here in Bellingham and fellow writer, um, would like to know if you found any descendants of people who were at the hospital. Um, um, and, and then yes. she also has a question about the unmarked graves. Um, you wonder kind of what the status of the, of the unmarked grave, the women in those graves were. But did you find some descendants? I did. It, it, that was one of the first things I did, actually, once I knew Elizabeth was the woman that I wanted to write about, because when I wrote The Radium Girls, you know, a huge part, a wonderful part of my research was to interview sons, daughters, sisters of The Radium Girls and really get to know those women, you know, through the eyes of their family. Um, now, of course, I'm not writing about women from the 1920s and 30s in this book. I'm writing about a woman from 1860. So I did find her family and they were wonderfully supportive, really grateful to them for their support. Uh, they, I don't even, I'm not, I didn't hear back from them, but they may even have been tuning in this evening because they're actually based in California. So they're on the West Coast. So I said, this is, if you want to come to an event, this is the event to come to. Um, and so it's great, great granddaughters that I'm speaking to who, of course, you know, there's such a passage of time there they don't have the same insights that they can offer me as a son or a daughter or a sister could with the Radium Girls. Um, and additionally to the passage of time, there was a, a shift in how people thought about insanity between the 19th and the 20th centuries. And the shift was that they suddenly believed that insanity was incurable and hereditary. They thought it would be passed down forever and ever through the families. So even though Elizabeth was sane, as I say, this stigma of insanity haunted her for the rest of her life. And there seemingly was a sort of commitment within the family not to talk about her anymore for fear that, you know, even breathing the word insanity and asylum might mean that the descendants of that family would be afflicted by mental illness. There was this fear around it. Um, and so actually, even if stories from the children, for example, Elizabeth's children could have been passed down. They weren't, there was a sort of real, you know, dead end and, and people didn't talk about her and they didn't pass the anecdotes down. One anecdote that I loved, however, which came from her great, great granddaughter was that she said that she still has Elizabeth's original first edition copies of her books, which are signed. She keeps them on her mantelpiece. And she said, uh, whenever there's a sort of major family celebration, for example, when her children went to prom, she said she always makes sure that when she takes her children's prom pictures, the books on the mantelpiece are visible in the image. And in this way, Elizabeth, the matriarch of this family, is still present at the family celebrations. Um, and I thought that was wonderful. That is wonderful. Oh, I love that. Um... Gosh, yes, it, it, it is talking about the timing of this, of this story, of, of this history. It is, I kept reminding myself as I was reading it, you know, this is all against the backdrop of the Civil War. Um, so what, what a, a tumultuous time in our history. And then to think about, to think about fighting this fight, being a woman who's trying to convince the world that she's not insane. Um, but you've but you've got the civil war going on. I kept being thinking, you know, people were just not going to pay attention to what she was trying to do because because of they exactly. were thinking they and, were, and that, that, it was a civil a war. Real, that's a that's a real battle for Elizabeth. And I and I, you know, there there was newspaper coverage of her and um a coverage of the trial. I mentioned courtroom drama earlier, coverage of the mm -hmm. trial. Um, but uh, not as much as I think there would have been had the papers not been completely, you know, right. column to column civil war material. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps that's partly why we don't know her so well, because, you know, the nation was focused on, you know, it had other priorities at the time when Elizabeth is starting to come to the fore. Right. Um, well, it, your writing is so compelling, and you know, as as people have been saying in the chat and in the in the Q and A, that you know, you're, you're, and as you said at the outset, you you write very novelistically, um, which I I appreciate. I mean, it just 
um, it's 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 quite riveting. Um, so Alexa mm -hmm. says wants to know because because of that she she said as she was reading it I was constantly thinking this needs to be a movie. So it's early yet. Has it been optioned or do you, it hasn't been optioned would you yet. be open to would you be open to some to that? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd be delighted. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, my, my agent said he's had some approaches already, which is uh, exciting. Um, but no, it's not been optioned yet. So if there's if there's any movie producers on this call, um, uh, please do give my agent a ring, Joel Gottler, IPG. Um, but no, I mean, and how amazing it, it would be if it happened, because this woman who's been completely forgotten by history, you know, she needs the silver screen treatment. And I, I have to say, as I was writing the book, I kept imagining what could be scenes from the movie. You know, there, there's a bit where um, she travels to, to Boston um, and she's selling her books and she's sort of going into the Navy Yard and the Custom House. And sort of in my head, it, it was this sort of, uh, you know, filmic montage where all you see is probably to some sort of, you know, soaring, fast-paced musical backdrop. And you see Elizabeth just going into these very masculine environments and sitting there and selling her books and then going into another, you know, carrying these books in heavy suitcases and then, you know, opening them up and, and you know, all these men buying her wares and sort of being absolutely transfixed by her story. Uh, so, yeah, I, as I wrote, I had a very, you know, filmic imagination as I was writing. And so, yeah, fingers crossed, it would be wonderful if someone thought, you know, what this story needs to be a film or a TV series or however they envisage it. Um, oh, it would gosh. be really wonderful for that to yeah. happen. And all of the potential for, for any scenes in the asylum, because all, all of that history, all of her, her reporting, because that's what she's doing. She's reporting from what's going on in the asylum. She that, is. And, and as I say, I'm, I mean, I didn't really touch that in the, in the presentation, but that for me was a really compelling part about why I wanted to write about it as well because you know I love for example uh Sylvia Plath the bell jar um one flew over the cuckoo's nest yes. I, I think there's this great sort of literary... the snake pit exactly um, and while of course I wouldn't you know even contemplate imagining my book alongside those greats but I mentioned them as uh, uh, something no but something that in you know inspired me and fascinated mm. me was you know, the way, you know, well, I, I just think insane asylums are fascinating. Yes. And that was something that I really loved digging into. And uh, the asylums actually in the mid 19th century would publish these biennial reports that are stuffed full of, you know, these visceral details about, um, you know, uh, what the grounds were like, for example, you know, the types of flowers that they had, the, the birds that were in the sky. And, um, you know, I was able to uh, really bring to life the, the wards, the straight jackets. Uh, the one detail that really shocked me in those reports is um, they used to put the patients to work. Uh, that's number one. So, you know, the economic efficiency of these hospitals was entirely reliant on the unpaid labour of their patients. Um, but what really struck me when it, it had a chart of everything that the women in the sewing room made, and Elizabeth was one of these women, and it said they made their own restraining jackets. Yes, yes. That that just took my breath away. Um, that the women were, you know, forced to work, and that's what they were forced to make as well. The jackets that would keep them constrained. Um, so yeah, so so all of that was another another part of the research and the book that I was personally fascinated by. Yeah. Well, I have to ask since we've talked so much about the potential, you know, page to screen. Who would play Elizabeth, Kate? Oh, well, I mean, there's so many great actresses out there. I, I, I couldn't, I don't think I could pick one. Um, it, and it's such a great part. That's the thing. And what I really love about it. Totally well Oscar worthy. It is Oscar totally material. Totally Oscar worthy. <laughs> and, and what I love as well, and it's something that I love in the book as well. You know, this is not, um, you know, this is a woman who's 43 when the book opens. She's in her 50s by the time it finishes. And. Um, and, you know, how rare is it to find a woman of a certain age, uh, you know, being the heroine and, you know, having all these life changing and, you know, life enhancing experiences, as it turns out. Um, that, that was something that I was really attracted to as well, that actually it's not a sort of young nouvelle woman. This is, a, a, a you know, a proper woman, a woman in her, her 40s who's sort of, you know, fully there and doing it. And I think that's a really important part of the story as, as well. And in terms of the movie, I think that's a gift that any of the amazing actresses 
um, who hover around that sort of age bracket. You know, how rare is it to get a part like this? Um, so, you know, hopefully someone will will make it. <laughs> oh, well, until then, the I, I always prefer the book anyway. The, the book, <laughs> the book is fabulous. Um, it isn't you. hardcover. I got the I was lucky enough to get the advanced reader copy. Yeah. Um, is, but yes, it's a gorgeous book. I love the cover too. Um, and papers, look. <laughs> oh, beautiful. The There's asylum. the hospital. Yes. yes. Oh my goodness. Looking wow. like a, a grand stately home. As, as Elizabeth said, the, the trappings, you know, the, the, this, this beautiful building, the beautiful grounds, it was there mm. to make a passerby I think this place is a heaven instead of a hell. Right. Oh, wow. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for for sharing Elizabeth's story with us, for for it's bringing nice. her bringing her back into the into the spotlight. Um, my pleasure and privilege, and thank you for the opportunity to to talk to everyone about it and for all your support of the book. Oh gosh, well, it's it's our pleasure and our honor. I have put the chat the link in the chat to our. Um, to our webpage where people can purchase the book. As I mentioned at the beginning, we will have autographed book plates that are en route to us. So if you purchase a copy from Village Books, um, you will get a, an autographed copy or autographed, excuse me, not copy. It's a pandemic autographed book plate. <laughs> yeah. um, it's signed on that sofa just there. So. Oh, <laughs> oh that's, that's, that's even better. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. We get to actually in, imagine you sitting at your sofa it, signing yeah, those. Really happen. <laughs> thank you. Well, Kate, this has been such a pleasure. And thank you to the audience. Thank you, Kate. Kate, do you have any last words for our audience? No, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. I, I know, you know, it's summertime. People's time is pressing. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. So thank you so much for coming to listen and to hear all about Elizabeth Packard. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Stay well. And hopefully, Kate, you get to go back to bed. Maybe get, a few, <laughs> get a few more winks. Okay. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks for coming.